friends. I haven't had a five-star book in over a month, and I think that's a problem. I actually hadn't realized up until maybe a few days ago that manhwa aside, which I do think it's a different rating metric, I have not had a single five-star book since January. I think a lot of things feeling-wise have come close, but yet nothing ends up being a full five-star. And so we are here to correct that, and we are here to find a five-star book, whatever it may cost us. And so this video won't end until I find a five-star book. A very dramatic way of saying welcome or welcome back to the channel, friends. I have never embarked on this journey. I have seen these videos everywhere. I have seen Bella from Throne of Pages do it. I have seen Sarah Caroli do it. I have seen Hayley Pham do it. And I have been deadly afraid of making this because what happens if we're just stuck in a timeless loop where I never find a five-star book and this video never ends? The thought is terrifying. And so I have had this video idea in my head. I've been simmering it. I think it could be a lot of fun. But right now, I am in desperate need of a little bit of escapism. I am in desperate need of the search for a five-star book. I am just in desperate need of a book that will make me forget absolutely everything and just immerse me fully into the story to the point where I am kicking and screaming and crying because the book is so good and I never wanted to stop, but it just has to eventually. And so naturally, I'm looking at my TBR and I'm looking at the fact that we have got a lot of great contenders for this video. I am looking at the Seven Year Slip by Ashley Poston. I have never read anything by this author, so I really don't know what to expect writing-wise. I don't know how her prose is like. I don't know how she structures her stories. And so I really don't know what to expect with this one, but I think it could be a lot of fun. I know there's a cooking element to this, which I have been desperately in the search for. I know it's also a magical realism, so we do have a little bit of magic thrown in the midst of the romance. It's set in New York, and we've just got a bunch of other elements that I think I could really enjoy. I don't know if this is going to be a five star. Most times romance books for me are not a five star, so if it does end up being a five star, it'll be one surprising and two the end of the video. So we'll see how it goes. I'm about to go make myself a cup of tea. We can start reading this. I'll catch up with you guys once I know enough about the story to kind of give you an overview, and then we'll go from there. I'll keep you updated on the journey. Let's go make a cup of tea, and let's start reading The Seven Year Slip. <laughs> Intentional. I didn't realize I had matched my mug to the book, but I picked out my current favorite mug, which is a pivot cup from Friends. Bad day, pivot. This is one of my favorite TV shows. I've watched it around like 13 times. It is the show that lulled me to sleep in many years when I've had a lot of difficulty going to bed. And it was just like my background show as I was cooking, getting ready, as I was eating any meal that was a show playing in the background. My grandmother had more than a few words to say when I was nine years old and watching it for the first time but it kind of stuck around. So this is the mug of the day, which again, I didn't realize I kind of matched to the book, but it works out. It's a very cute monochromatic moment. I have made progress with the seven year slip. I am 88 pages in, so about to start chapter 10. And I am really enjoying this so far. I don't know that it's right off the go giving me like five star feels, but really anything can happen. So in this one, we follow Clementine after her aunt's passing. Her and her aunt used to be super close. She used to go to her aunt's place every summer. They've traveled to the world together. She was her biggest confidant and she grew up with her aunt telling her these crazy stories about how her apartment was magical and how it had the ability to take you either seven years into the future or seven years in the past. And this event only really seems to happen when you're at a big crossroads in your life. If there is like a death tower moment, again, a crossroads, if you've got something to figure out, it seems like the apartment kind of grants you with the presence of the person that is most going to help you through that time. She grew up kind of believing the notion of it and dreaming of the day that it would happen to her and yet it never did because it's meant to happen like at a very specific time in your life. She has moved into her aunt's apartment and she has become very fixated on her work as a means to distract herself from the emotional turmoil that takes place in the background so she's really just using it as a distraction. She doesn't seem to love her job as a book publicist and yet she does that every single day and so at the moment it seems like she's been having to reconcile the idea of 
this getting to be the peak of her career and her really growing in the industry that she is in, whilst at the same time having to grieve her grandmother whilst not wanting to do it, because she doesn't want to accept the fact that she's gone. And so one day she just goes back to her apartment, she gets there, she falls asleep, and in the most probably traumatic way possible, she is shaken awake by a stranger called Iwan, who basically tells her that he is subletting the apartment from her aunt and that he is going to be staying there for the summer. He keeps mentioning neighbors and people that are no longer in this building that have also passed away. In her head, she's just completely thrown off by this situation and she's like, get the fuck out of my apartment. Like, I don't know who you think you are or what you're doing here or what sick joke you're trying to pull on me, but it's not going to happen. It turns out she allows him to stay in the apartment. She's like, okay, I guess we can both live here for the summer. She obviously figures out that he is seven years in the past, they basically strike up this agreement to roam for the next three to four months. And he is already so incredibly attractive, like, Listen, the circumstances in which he shows up, not great, but he is an aspiring chef. He has studied culinary arts. He's very gifted in the kitchen. The very first thing this man does after she kicks him out and then he comes back is to offer dinner. As in like, I'm going to make dinner. I'll cook us a little something. That is immensely attractive. I love that. And so he cooks them dinner and he starts gushing about his life and about his trajectory and about his family. So right from the go, they start getting to know each other. He has no idea, by the way, that she is in his future. And so that to me is one of the most interesting parts of this book is I would have thought that she would have said something. And so I am truly wondering what that is going to be dynamic wise and how that's going to play out. And I also just have a feeling that she's already kind of bumped into him at the beginning of the book, but she is not aware of who he is or wasn't at the time. And so we'll see how it plays out because I think the fact that he doesn't know inside this timeline, I think is a little bit concerning because we already know that's probably gonna play out in the third act conflict. Can't wait to keep on reading. I'm about to go do so while I drink the rest of my tea and we'll see how far into this I'm able to get to today. Honestly, I don't have anything else else to do but reading because I've carved out the day for that. So I wouldn't be surprised if I managed to finish this today. We'll see where the day takes us. <laughs> so I'm over here reading just casually and Ashley Poston drops this line. And then Nate came along three months later and thought that he could fix me, I guess, with a little well-placed love. Except I didn't need to be fixed. I'd gone through the worst day of my life by myself and I came out the other side a person who survived it. That was not something to fix. I didn't need to be fixed. I just needed to be reminded that I was human. And dinner with a stranger who didn't look at me like I was broken had been a surprisingly good start. Thanks, Ashley Poston. <laughs> left of the seven year slip. I also love that you can probably hear Vin chewing, eating in the background. I am on page 227, about to start chapter 29, and I just had to come on here and give you guys one probable last update before I finish this. I thought this book was going to play out very differently, and it's really not a bad thing, by the way, just prefacing it with saying that, because I feel like that very well could be followed by, and I really don't like it. No, I really, really like how this book is playing out. I genuinely thought that all of Ewan and Clementine's interactions would be happening inside the apartment in the past, but the fact that that is not all we get of them and from them, and that the dynamic is very different than that, I am absolutely eating up. It really lends itself for such great angst where you really don't know. I mean, you obviously know where Clementine's head is at because like you, you're getting the thoughts actively as you read. But with Ewan specifically, like you don't know where he's at. You can tell he's very into her. You can tell there's a lot in his 
his mind. But as far as what happened in their last interaction that he remembers in the past, what happened then that is influencing the way that he is going about things now? I really am loving the way that everything is playing out. I think the side characters too are amazing. I really do wish we would be getting more of Drew and Fiona, who are the two friends that we see of Clementine's. And I really wish that we'd see more of them because I think as far as the interactions that we've seen from Iwan's friends, Miguel and Isa, their interactions seem a lot more personal, intimate, heartfelt versus Drew and Fiona that although we can tell that they are friends in the way that they text and interact with each other, they definitely are seen more in a work context because they are co-workers as well. And so I wish we'd see them more outside of that setting to see more of their dynamic too because I feel like they'd enrich the story so much in the same way that just this one chapter with Miguel and Isa did. All of the tidbits of food and cooking and the culinary world, what it takes to get Michelin starred, and exactly everything that goes behind the scenes that a lot of people don't get to see or even understand as part of the food industry. You're getting home super tired, you're overworked, you're underpaid. A lot of the time because you're cooking all day, you don't wanna get home and cook and chopping up a few veggies after you've been doing that all day long. And so I have seen it firsthand and, and I think it's really elevated my level of appreciation for people in that industry. I think one of the things that I'm really enjoying the most is the way that Ashley Pasta navigates the conversation surrounding grief. She talks about it in such a heartbreaking yet healing way. The way that she talks about the essence of a person and how you miss a person and what triggers you missing that person, what reminds you of someone, what keeps their memory alive. The way she talks about it is so intimate that I cannot help but be heartbroken alongside Clementine when she does talk about her aunt. And when we finally get to the bit where we find out exactly what happened to the aunt, it just absolutely broke my heart. And so the way that she talks about it on both ends, both from Iwan's side and then from Clementine, I am just absolutely gobsmacked at the level of detail and care and love and intimacy that goes into that conversation because I think she navigates it so very well, perhaps in one of the best ways I have seen written in fiction. And so that aspect I'm really enjoying. And then on top of that too, the conversation surrounding your work, what you you choose to do professionally and how oftentimes with time your relationship with your work evolves so much that you cannot recognize where your love and passion for it starts and where it ends or even if it exists anymore and I think it's a conversation with yourself that everybody experiences at some point and I think the way that she's also establishing that specific narrative I am so very much enjoying particularly for Clementine who's somebody who you can tell she appreciates the job she likes her job but does does she love it? Is she passionate about it in the same way that she was when she got into it? And when she is asked, you know, how did you get into your job? She says that she just did. And she cannot pinpoint that passion that she perhaps could have years ago. I really am enjoying it all. I think that it's a really, really good book. I am very near about to say like, it could be a five-star book. It very well could be, but we'll see what the last hundred pages do. Let's read the last hundred pages of the seven years lip. eating, makeup is off. Now we've got a hoodie on because let me tell you something about the previous sweater we were wearing. It was cute. I really liked the color, but it was very itchy and I have very sensitive skin. So I just had to take it off real quick. And now instead we're wearing Love and Tour merch because life is too short not to. I finished the seven year slip, which I'm not going to lie. There was a point where I was like, oh, maybe I should just put on my current K-drama because I started watching my demon yesterday and I am really, really enjoying it. So I was like, oh, maybe I should just pop on that while I do some diamond painting and just kind of switch around the cozy hobby for the day. But uh, no, this had a grip on me and I finished it. It is sadly not a five star though. And there was very nearly a point after we found out about how the aunt died and that whole explanation that I deeply thought I was going to rate this a five star. What made me not give it a full five, I think I'm gonna go for a 4.5, which is very much near it. But the reason why I'm not gonna give it a full five is because the one
one aspect of the book that I think worked against it at times was one, as soon as Clementine sees Iwan, she basically just goes, oh, I'm in bad. I'm in, I just know I'm in bad and I just know I'm going to fall for this man. And it's kind of insta-lovey in a way, like the attraction is there and the chemistry is there, but at times it comes across so insta-lovey and I don't love that. Hi, Vin. And then on top of that, the very end felt just a little too nice, just like wrapped up with too nice a bow and it almost felt a little bit too cheesy, believe it or not. I like myself a certain level of cheese, but maybe not so much where I'm like, oh, I feel like there must have been just a little bit more time just in that space of we're not talking to each other before we finally come back and confess the I love you. But otherwise, the book was really, really good. It makes me want to read more Ashley Poston. I know this is the same writer for The Dead Romantics, so maybe I'll check that out. And I think she's got a new book coming out this year, so maybe also something to check out. And now it's a matter of choosing what book is next because I kind of feel like after I totally was trying to open this backwards too, but I think I need to switch to a fantasy. And I think this may be the perfect time to pick up a book that I have been thinking about picking up for quite some time. So I'll just queue to the B-roll, I'll queue to the next section, and we'll see if I actually end up picking the book I've been thinking about picking up for a few weeks now tomorrow. I think that could be a great time. It'll be a solid like 12 hours for me. It'll just be a few seconds for you. Started and it's powerless by Lauren Roberts and I'm so excited about so I am 143 pages in. I am so sorry that the update is coming in at this point in time, almost 150 pages into the book. But I started this yesterday. I am also annotating the book. It's a really fun time. I cannot say at this time that I'm predicting this to be a five star like I had initially expected it to be when I added it to my February TBR. However, it's a really good book. I can tell that it's a debut. I can tell that the author wrote it at a very young age in consideration. I think she wrote this when she was 16. And so I think in ways it is noticeable that this is a debut and that it was written at the age that it was because there are certain parts structurally writing wise that are not necessarily working for me. And I understand that because it's YA, there may be perhaps a bigger need to over explain things, but I really don't feel like this book gives readers enough credit and it tends to over explain the most random things in ways that I do find a tad bit annoying and I find my Myself kind of mentally rearranging sentences and saying, oh, maybe you could have scrapped this, maybe you could have added this, or maybe if you mesh these two sentences together, maybe that could have flowed a little bit better. I find myself looking at the story just a little bit more critically, but I'm trying to kind of reconcile the two things of, yes, maybe the writing is not the best in terms of structure, but at the very least, it is an enjoyable story. And so I'm trying to focus more on the enjoyment of it. And I also have to say that one of my biggest things about this book so far is that I am loving Kai more than I'm enjoying Peyton. Peyton is the main character. I don't find her to have a very distinct personality, something that kind of sets her apart. So basically in this one, we have a Hunger Games setup, which is a consequence from the plague. The plague arrived in Ilia, which is the land country where this is set in. And it basically took the country by storm. The people who survived it were deemed worthy enough to receive supernatural powers. And it's very kind of X-Men-like in the way that they met manifest and in the type of powers that people possess. So basically a section of people called the elites, which are the highest in society, they received powers. Then below them are the mundanes, which are people who got lesser powers. And then on the bottom tier, we have got the ordinaries, which are regular people like you and me who didn't receive any sort of ability. And the king basically ruled that the ordinaries were a crime against the kingdom. And 
so at any point if an ordinary is spotted they are to be reported and an enforcer is supposed to come in and execute said ordinary and Peyton herself our main character is an ordinary masking as a mundane she's pretending to be a psychic to stay alive and one day she ends up meeting Kai she saves his life and as a consequence of saving the crown prince she ends up being entered into the purging trials which is a competition that happens every five years to grab the best of the best elites with a handful of mundanes throw them into an arena or into a controlled setting where they can fight to I think the death and basically crown the victor who wins 20,000 shillings which is a shitload of money where they're at and you basically win the glory and the fame and money and you can turn your life around if you're a mundane and if you're an elite then you just get more money and this is all as a means to control the people keep them in line and very much exert the king's power it seems that Peyton herself as part of her backstory with her father in particular who was a healer so he was an elite there does seem to be some sort of backstory between her father and the king that basically fuels her rage against the system against the king himself and that basically pushes her to try her absolute bestest when it comes to the trials and there also seems to be a rebellion some sort of rebel group that is planning some sort of uprising to I will assume do something to dethrone the king or to destabilize the country there are not too many details so far because really all that we have gotten so far is the exposition to explain what exactly the purging trials are to an extent although not fully and then who the crown family is aside from also the actual plague that went around and the different tiers of power and society that exist within this world but aside from that we haven't really seen too much we've also seen the training portion and the presentation kind of exactly like the hunger games in the same way that they present the tributes and they have like these ceremonies and these balls and these events to present said tributes to the people to kind of win their favor win popularity and kind of to distract the people from everything else happening so although it's not establishing too much conversation surrounding why exactly these things are happening it is very much following a similar structure to the Hunger Games so I don't find it wholly original because of it because I find that a lot of beats and scenes are very akin I will continue reading and see kind of where it takes me and see where it goes and we'll go from there I'll keep you updated but it's definitely a fun one an interesting one so far friends oh friends we've got something to talk about so let me set you up right here on the kitchen counter because events have occurred with a cat eating in the background i must admit i cannot do it anymore friends i read 51 percent of powerless got to chapter 30 and if i read this boy called payton vicious little thing one more time i shall lose it i will lose my mind because i thought i was in for a fun time with dynamic in intricate characters with really great backgrounds and storylines and a really cutthroat plot and the stakes being very high and sadly even though it was fun to begin with it has dwindled to a point where it's been a few days since I last picked this up I forced myself to pick it back up today I read about 50 pages and I simply cannot do it anymore and so instead of testing my sanity I'm just going to DNF this book entirely I am so very disappointed at one the fact that that a lot of scenes from this book or a lot of moments seem to be taken right out of the Hunger Games. And if the comp is the Hunger Games, I expect similar dynamics and perhaps similar discussions, but not necessarily the same scenes. And so that in and of itself is incredibly disappointing. But Peyton as well as the protagonist, I don't find her to have a personality. She's just incredibly bland. She could literally be any other female protagonist from any other book. And I tell you, sure, I thought her plot would have been a lot more interesting interesting considering the fact that she is at risk every single day just because of what she is because she doesn't have any powers because she doesn't have any abilities and yet everything comes so easy for her it's like she figures out the answer to everything so fast there are no obstacles there are no hurdles there is no danger she doesn't even seem to be in the realm of anybody being suspicious of her and so it is immensely infuriating to see her just parade about everything 
so easily, including the trial so far. And then on top of that with Kai, I thought I was gonna get a love interest that was yes, sarcastic and who yes, maybe had a little bit of like a bantery persona. Those are pretty typical with YA fantasies. And yet I thought that with that, we'd get a plot line where he discusses very in depth all of his obligations and standards and pressures as a prince and particularly training to be an enforcer and that being a role to fulfill to protect his family, the royal crown, and to also protect the people. And yet anytime he is asked anything of importance about his family, about him, about his role, he always says without going into much detail, why are we sparing details? If there is anything a book is meant to do is to give you the details. And so I'm just so frustrated that anytime we kind of near a great conversation, anytime we near any sort of character exposure and world building of any kind, it's kind of drawn back by the author. And I think more than anything, this book to me, and I'm so saddened by it, but it just seems so overwritten. And you can tell that a lot of things were put there purposefully by the author, that it doesn't feel like the characters are real, like the world is real, like the plot is real. Kai just seems like a caricature because all he does is flirt with Peyton in the strangest of ways, in the strangest of scenarios. They're literally in the middle of the trials right now and they're meant to be facing danger. And what does this man decide to do? Oh, let's dance without music and be romantic. And let me preach about how my favorite color is blue and how I wouldn't mind drowning because it's the color of her eyes. Do we really think in the grand scheme of the plot that seems important? It's just a little bit odd to me. And then also the book, and I can't help my brain doing this, and I really disliked that book as well. It reminds me of The Serpent and the Wings of Night, and I really did not like that book. And so just many things are kind of working against it at the moment. And instead of testing my sanity, I think I'm just gonna put this one down. I'm sad because it was a five-star prediction. I was putting it aside because I kept saying it was gonna be a five-star, and I was like prolonging the process because I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna love it so much. And yet, now it's time to pick up something else, I guess, and see if the next thing we pick up is actually gonna be a five star. and welcome to the next update after I've started a new book literally in the same day I DNF'd Powerless. Cheers to that. I have read a lot of Sweet Bean Paste. I didn't think I'd be flying through this book as fast as I am. I think after coming out of a not so great book, it's kind of easy to read something that is well written. And so I got to page 118, which is chapter 18 actually. And at this point I have less than 100 pages left. So I don't know how we got here, but we have read about that much of the book. And so in this one, we follow Santaro after he's been released from jail as he takes over running the shop that he used to work in right after he came out from serving his time. And the owner has passed away. His wife is now the one handling the business, but Sentaro is the one handling the everyday operations from actually making the dorayaki, which are Japanese pancakes filled with sweet bean paste, all the way to handling customers and having the ledgers in order. And again, all of the technical stuff kind of done. And so one day he gets this old lady that approaches is his shop called Tokwe and she sees that they are hiring and she's like dude I might as well just come work for you I have been making sweet bean paste for over 40 years and so you do well with my experience and I think I can do a lot of great for the good of your business and he immediately says no not because of her age not because of the fact that he doesn't believe in her skill although it is partly that but it mostly is the fact that she she does have disfigured hands, she does have facial paralysis, and he is immediately very judgmental and standoffish toward her because he doesn't really know what condition has brought on what is manifesting on a physical level. And so he immediately says no. But Tokue is very insistent, so she keeps coming back to the shop and she keeps
keeps insisting that she wants to work there and she hands a note with her name and she keeps saying like, I'll work for even less than what you're offering. I just want to make sweet bean paste. And one time he gets to try her creation and he realizes that she's actually not joking. Her sweet bean paste is the best one he has ever tried. And he just about says yes to hiring her and letting her work at the shop. But there are loads of stipulations that come with it and a lot of different rules and outlines because he doesn't want her appearance to basically affect the performance of the shop. And the book kind of goes from there detailing their dynamic as they are now working together and as they learn small tidbits of each other through time. So whether it is that Sentaro opens up about his past a little bit and exactly why he's running this shop all the way to exactly what is going on in Tokue's life and what happened in her past that has led to a lot of the things manifesting now in her life. And I found the book to be incredibly wholesome and just absolutely lovely. I have a feeling I'm going to cry more towards the end. We just got a scene with another lady who has the exact same condition as Tokue. And she also mentioned how she would have loved to work at the shop. And just the joy that Tokue and even this other lady, I forget her name, she was just mentioned, Moriyama. The fact that both of them were so joyful, it's such a relatively simple thing. And that they find such passion in it is absolutely beautiful to read about. It really does shed light to the things that people don't understand when it comes to illness, when it comes to diseases, when it comes to any sort of condition that is either invisible or visible, and how people are very quick to judge just because of what they perceive to be right or what they think have been told is right. But that is not always the case. They are not always right. And so the book takes a closer look at how people like Tokue are basically shunned societally because of a belief that everybody holds, again, that may not always be correct, and it may as well just be entirely false, and it is a very heartbreaking thing to see because you can tell that Tokue has so much to offer. She's just such a kind and gentle soul, and the fact that nobody wants her around just because of her condition just breaks my soul, so I hope that that gets better as the book goes on. I hope we find out even more more information about Sentaro in particular because I feel like at the moment we know more about Tokue than we do him and so I'm interested to read more and see where that kind of comes up and we'll see how things go because I really don't know what the purpose for like this last half of the book will be or where it's gonna go if he's gonna start his own business if they're going to do something together and if he's going to include the other people in the Suntorium that they're currently visiting and so I am very very curious as to where the story is leading at this point on because I really don't know. finally finished sweet bean paste and I wanted this to be a five star so desperately bad. I generally thought I was going to find a new favorite in sweet bean paste. I had been putting it off for about I think over a year really and I was doing so in the hopes that I would read this at the right time and I would find it to be a five star and it's not. <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna rate this, but this book's ultimate message or its exploration can be boiled down to what is our value as humans on this earth outside of the things that we can tangibly do. Because when we observe the day-to-day, -day, we always quantify our value and what we bring to the table based on the things that we are able to do, based on how many hours we work, how much money we've got on the bank, how many friends we have, how we manage to carry ourselves on a daily basis, how many networking opportunities we successfully get to carry out. And although a lot of those things are great, the author really seeks to look past that and look at the actual knitting of the universe and how we are all interconnected to the universe to kind of serve this higher purpose, whatever it may be. And so at the end of the book, this one quote becomes really important, which goes, we were born to see and listen to the world, which is alluding to a different kind of purpose other than what we can tangibly again do. And so I think on that, 
end, the book was really good. However, does that message come across extremely well? I wouldn't say that it does in a lot of parts of the book. It has a whole author's note at the back of it explaining exactly why the author decided to go about this narrative and to talk about the themes that he did talk about, including leprosy, which is a big subject matter in the book. However, I think the message does kind of get a bit lost. And as you were reading the book, at least for me, it wasn't very clear at times to understand what exactly the author was trying to do through the vessel of Tokue in particular, and why even somebody like Sentaro has the past that he does. It almost seems unimportant to the plot. And so it, it has emphasis in the story. However, unless it is to exemplify some sort of discrimination towards Sentaro for being an ex-con, it really doesn't show up or has any weight really anywhere in the story. And so it was okay. It was a good time. I think it was a very wholesome story. I really liked seeing Tokue find not necessarily her calling, but something to do after having lived such a tough life experience like she did. And so to see a character finally find that one place where they can be themselves and they can do the one thing that they really love and appreciate and that they were able to connect with somebody outside of their typical circle through this means, it was honestly really wholesome. But I wasn't entirely moved by it the way that I thought I would be. I thought I'd be sobbing my eyes out and that it would be like a wholly life-changing experience. And alas, it was not. So I'm thinking I'm gonna give it three stars. <laughs> I keep bouncing back and forth with the rating, but honestly, my initial assessment of this book is probably going to be a three star. And that was like after a solid 150 pages. I think it stands strong. And so I think I'm gonna leave it at a three star. And so now we have to choose our next book because we still are not done and we still have not found a five star book. Please hold, let me just bring over some options. So I'm thinking any of these three options could be really, really fun. I just don't know where I want to go. So naturally, I am leaning towards Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies because I've already started this book and I am currently 120 pages into it. I just don't know if this is the vibe I want to go for right now, but I'm like, listen, it could be a fun time to get this finished in this video so that I don't have to postpone finishing this book. So I am thinking about this, but it's not the book that my soul wants. Magnolia Parks, The Long Way Home, which I am very scared to read, but I'm also in the mood to read it right now. I'm like, I am down for the mess at the moment. Or A Tempest of Tea by Hafsa Faisal. Two very different books. This one is a fantasy. It's got vampires. It's got a heist. And it sounds very fun. This one is just messy. I think a decision has been made. I think I'm starting A Tempest of Tea. We're nearing the end of the video. I'm so excited. I think we may have found a five-star book. Obviously, I don't want to speak too early because I am just 106 pages into A Tempest of Tea, but I think Miss Hafsa Faisal may have done it. So in A Tempest of Tea, we follow Arthi, who alongside Jin, her kind of adoptive brother, they own a tea room called Spindrift together. And in Spindrift, they are a tea house by day and a blood house by dark. They feed a lot of those lower tier vampires that they vampire nobility or vampire high society wouldn't accept in their circles. And she makes sure to provide everything that they would need after dark. So when Spindrift is threatened by one of the monarchs called the Ram, Arthi basically embarks on a journey with Jin and some other companions to perform a heist. She bands up with Laith Sayad. He is from Arawiya and he is a Hashashin. Then we have got Flick, who is a forger and one vampire himself, Matteo Andoni, who is the key to getting into the Ethereum, where they're performing the heist. The Ethereum is like this ultra elite vampire society that only allows the best and highest ranking vampires to enter it. And Mateo himself has a key to basically get inside. And so he is a key component to this operation because without him, they can't get the Ram's ledger, which is what they are seeking in order to save Spindrift. And so right off the bat, the book starts out so well. Arthi is giving peak Tom Shelby vibes from Peaky Blind. And if I had to explain and describe
describe this book as anything, it would probably be Peaky Blinders meets Six of Crows. And I didn't particularly love Six of Crows. You guys know that I DNF'd it. So I think this is going to become my Joker. I think this is going to be my version of Six of Crows. Arthi immediately is set up to be like this super cutthroat character that she wouldn't necessarily kill anybody. That's not on her roster of things she'd ever like to do. But her presence is enough to intimidate and perform extortion and to get people to do her bidding without really doing a whole lot. So she is very much respected and feared in White Roaring, which is the setting for the book. And then Jin is basically her hand. He does all of the dirty work that she wouldn't typically perform. He also has great sleight of hand. So whenever she needs to grab onto anything that is not necessarily hers, Jin is the person to go to. Their dynamic is so sarcastic and bantery. It kind of reminds me of the banter that we see a lot in the Shadowhunter Chronicles by Cassandra Clare. I absolutely love that. And so I immediately fell in love with them as soon as I started the book. I think there's also like a slight BTS reference in this because when people ask him his name, he goes, it's Jin, it's not that hard. And then he mentioned something about it, if, if a band singing about butter would, would make a song about it or something. I was like, what are you talking about? So I think that was like a very slight BTS reference in this book. I may be making that up, but I do believe that is the case. And so immediately from those two, I just got the best vibes. And then Flick definitely looks like the character that has got a lot to prove to kind of make it, especially given the relations that her family is making. And then with Mateo and Laith, which are Arthi's love interests, I am already loving, though I will say, I think I kind of like Laith a little bit more. The fact that Laith calls her Habibi and she does not know what it means. So she immediately goes, I'm sure it's an insult and I don't care for it. I'm like, oh girl, if you only knew. And so immediately Laith is just, mm, I love him a lot. Mateo though is also a good contender though. There's just something about Laith that I'm like, baby girl, you better end up with Laith. I think that's gonna be my joker. And so I'm very excited to see how the book moves along. I'm thinking we can go to the office. I am sprinting right now with my patrons. And so I'm thinking we can sit down and read this and potentially finish it. And I think this may be our five star friends. Flash. Half of Isal knows what she's doing. I just cannot take it. Tell me why I sat down. I just have 80 pages left till I finish this book. And rest assured it is being finished tonight because it is giving peak. There is a heist going and there are too many things happening at once from we may get caught to we got caught to betrayals to reveals to plot twists. I just am losing my mind right now. And I genuinely do not think that the couple or the the version of the couple I'd like to get together and end up together is actually going to end up together. And for that, if that actually happens, half signed, I will have beef till the end of my days. I just love this book so much. And I knew she was not going to disappoint on top of the very interesting dynamics going on in the group. It's very much giving Ocean's Eleven. It's very much giving a group of people that shouldn't mesh together or shouldn't be seen together is banding up together kind of for the greater good, but everybody has ulterior motives. Motives. Lick has her own ulterior motives. Arthi has her secrets. Jin is there because he obviously wants to safe keep Spindrift and he seems to be like the most innocent person involved in this thing. Laith has his own motivations and Mateo is just there for the shits and giggles too, but honestly, a guy who has his secrets too. And so it's tense all around because you never really know what's going to happen between these characters. But more than anything, trust Hafsa to drop a book that while yes, is a fantasy book that is very much confined 
aligned to the metric of the heist because basically the entire book has either been planning the heist or the second part where I'm at right now has only been the heist. And so it's really only been surrounding this one plot, but there have been so many mentions of the thematic that she drops so strongly in her series because it was the same thing in the Arawilla duology where she has these really amazing conversations surrounding colonialism and conquests and how the scale is different for everybody. So while Arthi is very much on her ploy of revenge, everything was stripped away by people who got to her land and took it for everything it had to potentially give. And so while she is very much trying every day to break outside of that mold that people want to continuously put her in, not only as a foreigner, but also as a brown skinned girl, she is deemed a criminal, a thief and a heathen for doing all of the things that she does, which are in ways no different to the things that the colonizers of Athenia in the book are doing, but the standard is not the same. So while the monarchs and the kingdom and every single branch that has to perform a different job does what they have to do to secure something for the kingdom, while they do all that and they don't see nothing wrong with it and people also don't see anything wrong with it, Arthi is pit as a villain because of the things that she does. And so there is constant conversation in this book surrounding that specific thing. Who sets the standard and why is it not the same for everybody? And how exactly the throes of colonialism can strip people to their very, very core where their culture, their ancestry, their sense of identity, their language, their culture, just absolutely everything can be stripped away from them in a blink of an eye. And so I am very much enjoying that about this book too. I just knew again she was going to deliver on all fronts. And then on top of me already being obsessed with Arthi and Late, I'm obsessed with Jin and Flick too. I didn't think that Flick's POV would be such a prominent one in the story. It's kind of taken me by surprise because her chapters tend to be a little bit longer than Arthi's and Jin's, but her dynamic with Jin is so wonderful. The way that they banter back and forth, the way that Jin is so flirty, and it's so obvious that they like each other, but they're obviously afraid to make their respective moves. Jin, because he doesn't want to lose anybody, and Flick, because she feels like her mom would frown upon a union of this kind, and she's supposed to be a lady. But when they get together and they start on that witty back and forth, and you can tell that it's all of those light touches and glances, and her getting slammed against the wall because there's danger nearby and he wants to protect her, or when he tells her to shush because he doesn't want her to get hurt, or when she is in the potential zone of getting hurt and he gets extremely defensive and he's about to snap and kill everybody. I'm like, oh my God, yeah. I will chat with you guys on the flip side. I just knew Hafsa Faisal was going to drive me there and she definitely did not disappoint. Oh my god, that ending. I did not expect the last 80 pages to be so jam-packed with juiciness and more twists and more tension. And I just love how different this is from the Arawiya duology because down to the love interest and the dynamics and the tension is so different to that duology. And I just love that she brought a new, fresh story, unlike what she had written in the past, but with a lot of like similar thematics, but still so uniquely its own while still tying in with that other series. Because although this is not like a continuation of that one, you do see both of these like worlds in the same universe, I guess. So Arawiya is mentioned in here, which I thought was like a juicy little tidbit if you've already read her other books. And the ending truly was not anything that I was expecting. Like, what does it mean? Who is it? I'm just absolutely at a loss of words. 
It's like, I think I've already said everything I needed to say. Pick this up if you haven't already. Like, truly do yourselves a favor. This was absolutely wonderful. There is literally not a single complaint I have about this. I think she carried this out perfectly and get you the book because it is truly such a phenomenal time. I really don't have enough words for this. It was absolutely phenomenal. Lathe will forever live in my heart. That's all you guys need to know. And so will Arthi because I totally guessed the plot twist in Arthi's plotline. Like I just knew it. I just, oh, she knows what to do every single time. Honestly, this is why she has quickly become one of my favorite authors and why I will read anything she writes because she just understands the assignment. So this was absolutely perfect. No complaints, no notes. Thank you, your honor. I will be obsessed with this till the end of time. And that is the conclusion of today's video, friends. That is, this video doesn't end until I find a five-star book. We indeed did. It took us a few more tries than I was expecting, but also less tries than I was expecting. I was fully ready to dive into like a seven book video. So I am pleasantly surprised that we found it earlier than anticipated, but also later. So you know what I mean? And I'm glad it ended up being Hafsa's book because this is just a masterpiece. I love it so much. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. And if you'd like more content from me, I do have a Patreon. It's always linked down below. And just for April, you guys can get a seven day free trial to try out Patreon before you fully pledge, see everything it's got to offer from the sprints to the cozy game nights to the movie nights to the discord server to the early access to all of the posts going up. It's a fantastic time but I know it can be quite a lot to commit to something like Patreon so I want to make sure to give you guys just a little bit of a taste test of what you can potentially get by pledging so that is always linked down below alongside the rest of my socials. If you reach the end of the video obviously let's leave a tea emoji for a tempest of tea. I think it's very fitting or an umbrella emoji in honor of gin from a tempest of tea so either of those two either something tea related or an umbrella could do very very well as always comment down below if you've read any of the books i've read in this video or what are you currently reading what was your most recent five star i'd love to know because i always get some really great recs from you guys from the comment section so i'll be peeping as always to see what you guys are up to and what you guys are saying and yeah i love you guys so so much thank you so much for watching this one and i shall see you on the next one goodbye <laughs>